There's probably not cake.
time on planes and you put, you take little tracks and when nobody's looking, you put them in the... Remember, I got those from you. Last time. And I did that and the guy come and said, You're, that's against the law to do it. And I think he was a watcher. <laughs> and he didn't put me in jail. So I don't do that anymore. What else?
from the seals. And we're introduced now uh, in this seventh chapter to two groups of people. And we're going to be introduced to those that I have called the survivors. And that's not an unusual thought. It's not a unique thought. Uh, these will be those who will survive the fury of divine judgment. And first, in the first eight verses, we're going to look at uh, the, the Jewish evangelists, we'll call them, okay? And uh, who will be preserved on the face of the earth. They will survive the holocaust of divine wrath unleashed by the seal, trumpet, and bowl of judgments. God is going to protect them from the murderous efforts of the Antichrist and the henchmen uh, as they, their desire is to wipe out all believers from the face of the earth. Anyone that believes in the true God. Having survived the wars, the famines, the unprecedented natural disasters, disease, rampant, unchecked sinfulness, and savage persecution of the tribulation, these are those that will enter the millennial kingdom alive. Because there has to be a population to populate the millennial kingdom. And these will, in fact, uh, continue to populate the millennial kingdom. And then they'll be, the, uh, because those people will have an opportunity that are born during that time to, uh, to come to accept Christ. And then there'll be the judgment of all mankind. And the second group, to survive, and I say survive, <clears throat> that escape the divine fury of those who will be, is those that will be martyred and thus ushered into a blissful rest of heaven. They will survive because they are preserved. Okay? And we're going to read about them also in this, uh, this chapter. After the horrific events of the sixth seal, and before the opening of the seventh seal, which takes place in the next chapter, the Holy Spirit has provided for us this chapter, almost as if an interlude. This is an opportunity to catch your breath. This is an opportunity to reflect on what you've read up to this point, take in this additional teaching, and then we will continue with the, with the judgments that are before us. It's, it is also a reminder, you know, uh, Revelation can, can get kind of overwhelming in all these judgments, all of this wrath, but what you have exercised here in the seventh cha chapter is that you see God still being merciful, <coughs> still being gracious. Even, even though his wrath is just, still we, we see him function in his mercy. Uh, the visions that we're going to see uh, contrast the, what we have seen here. We see visions that there's a vast comparison in the contrast between the preparedness of believers who will be delivered from wrath with, we have just read of the panic the devastation of the unbelievers that will not survive the wrath. Here we have a different, we, we get a completely different outlook. Rather than being oppressed, here we have the overcomers. Okay, you know that we're familiar with that word, overcomers. Uh, second, our first Thessalonians 5, 3 uh, speaks to this. It says, destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. Okay. And then uh, later on in Thessalonians, Paul adds in the, in the second letter of Thessalonians in 1, 7 through 9, he says, The Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not, do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Later on in that same epistle, Paul writes in 2, 11 and 12, he says, For this reason God will send them strong delusion, okay, uh, that they should believe the lie. It'll be easy for them to believe that they, that, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had 
and righteousness. And don't, don't believe that they aren't given the opportunity to believe the truth. But once the, other, but once the time passes, the time passes. And there, God is just in the way He administers His righteousness. So the day of the Lord will eventually destroy all the ungodly. All the ungodly will be destroyed. Uh, anyone that does not go know God and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ will be destroyed. That God is a per, uh, preserver of his people in times of judgment is a very familiar theme in scripture, if you think of it. David, back in Psalms, Psalms 34, in 17 through 19, said, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such that have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Later in the 91st Psalm, beginning with the third verse, uh, we, we hear uh, God's promise to preserve the godly. It says, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrows that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near to you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Malachi describes God's comforting of those who feared being swept away by the judgment of the day of the Lord. Remember, we read the day of the Lord. That's, that's a significant phrase. Malachi 3, verse 16 begins, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I, I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall begin to again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and the one that does not serve him. He continues in the fourth chapter. For behold, the day is coming like a burning oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble, it says. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. And I'm sure Chad Ron to explain to us what fat, stall-fed calves are. Have you ever ate Kobe boot beef? You know, Kobe beef, their feet don't touch the ground. They hang them in slings, and they feed them milk, a <laughs> little uh, solid food, and they have these, these masseuse that massage their meat, their, their flesh. I've never, never had Kobe beef. Yeah, the oh, Japanese like that up. Mm -hmm. I know, right? The Japanese meat. Oh, yeah. It's, well, that's it's the name Kobe. <laughs> Japanese. That's who we start with. They, they, they raise them in slings. Their feet aren't allowed to touch the ground because they, they don't want them to have muscle. And their meat is, is a very, very uh, light color. And very tender. <laughs> we won't talk about it anymore. I'll get one. But, but a, a, a stall fed calf is the one that is prospering. As long as he's not a Kobe calf, he's doing okay. And then later on in 5 and 6, Malachi finishes. He says, Behold, I will send.
light of the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. It's always interesting how God uses the same scriptures for different lessons. Remember when God, remember when God, when God destroyed the world with a flood, who did he preserve? When he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, who did he preserve? Lot and his daughters. Yeah, he let them, he let them depart. When he destroyed Jericho, who did he preserve? Rahab and her household. And when he destroyed Egypt, who did he who did he uh, preserve? He preserved his nation, Israel. So we have seen the tribulation. Uh, to be a time of so far unparalleled, unparalleled judgment, disaster, and death. And it will also be, for many, a time of unparalleled salvation. Some of those redeemed out of the tribulation have already been mentioned earlier in connection with the fifth seal. These are the martyrs, remember? Killed because of their faithfulness to the Word of God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. And surely... With the amount of wars, famine, and natural disasters that God is going to bring in judgment on the earth, there will be believers that will perish in those uh, type of things. Their physical deaths, however, are not a result of God's wrath. Just as today, when a believer dies, you don't die because of God's wrath. God's judgment on the world and anti and antichrist persecution, uh, which will cause the deaths at that time, are just the means by which God ushers home those of his children into his presence. It has nothing to do with his wrath. All it has to do with him is calling you home. Come home, my children, and be with me. Let, the, uh, let me provide for you for an eternity. So, uh, there, but there will be believers that don't die, but survive to populate the millennial kingdom. And Jesus taught that truth in Matthew 25, 14. Okay. And uh, where the goats, uh, the unsaved will be cast into hell. And, but to the, sh the sheep, the saved, Jesus says, come, you are, who, who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So believers who are alive at the Lord's second coming will live on his, in, uh, on his, in his earthly kingdom. Many of those who enter the millennial kingdom alive will be Gentiles. But the tribulation is also the time of Israel's national salvation. Uh, this is what the prophets spoke of. And the most detailed description of that event is found in Zechariah's prophecy in the 12th chapter, the 10th verse. And it begins, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. The Jews will come to recognize who Jesus Christ is. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning that had not ribbed them at the plain of Magidan. Magidan. Magidan, the Greek name for Magidan is Armageddon. In the 12th verse, and the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, and the family of the house of Mason by, their, by itself, and the wives by themselves. Then it talks about the family of Levi, etc., etc. All the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. In that day, a fountain shall be opened. For the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and uncleanness. And then he continues, verse 8. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. 
I will bring the one third through the fire, okay, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will then say, the Lord is my God. That's a significant phrase. Mm -hmm. For a Jew to us, the Lord is my God, in recognition of the personage of Jesus Christ. This is also a time that Paul spoke of in uh, Romans 11, 26, and so all Israel will be saved. When it says all Israel, it means everyone that's supposed to be, as, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away on God from Jacob. So in Revelation 7, we are introduced to the group of survivors preserved in the maelstrom of the tribulation who have been refined as the fury hits. They are set apart for special service and they're set apart for special by special protection. In John's vision of this special group, I'm going to break down into uh, three categories or three features. First, we will speak of the wrath which is restrained. Then we will speak of the saints that are sealed. And then we'll, we will speak of the Israelites who are identified. So that's our intro to the seventh chapter. And our source scripture tonight will be 7, 1 through 3. If you're ready for the word of God, we signify that by saying amen. amen. And will you please stand for the reading? God's word. <laughs> Revelation 7, 1 reads as follows. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. That's a good thing. You can sit down. Thank you. So, in regards to the, the wrath restraint, the phrase that begins the seventh chapter in the New King James, it says, after these things, and that phrase is followed almost always in the Greek by the verb edon uh, in the Greek, which means to see. After these things, I saw is the, is the emphasis. And as we have discussed before, that phraseology signifies that we are now beginning a new vision, okay? We have left the sixth seal, and now John is about to see something new. He, in some way, his glance, his vision has been changed, and we see a new depiction before him. Uh, the scene... We know changes from a time of judgment. Now we will speak to a special protection for the godly. Okay? So it's always important. As the vision unfolds, John sees, the first thing he sees are four angels. And angels are, are frequently associated in scripture with God's judgment. Right? Uh, these four are given a great and mighty power over the elements of nature. In our scene, John says that they are standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. Now, if you go on Google and Google the four corners of the earth, if you Google down a little ways, you can find the skeptical... Uh, criticism of non-believers at John's words. In fact, they almost pro 
portray John as being in a fantasy world. How could someone, supposedly so knowledgeable, written in a book that contains no lie, believe that the earth has four corners? Well, that would mean the earth is flat. The problem with that verbiage is that it does not mean that the earth is flat. Let me read for you what it does mean. This is a quote from Henry M. Morris. Henry M. Morris is a very significant man in regards to creation research. He began the Creation Research Society, and he's one of the founders of the, uh, of the Institute for Creation Research, which you should be aware of. Uh, he is considered by most people to be the father of modern creation science, which became necessary in our world because of the perversion of our science. Okay? But this is a quote from Henry M. M. Morris. Accurate, accurate modern, modern geo, geodetic measurements, and geodetic is nothing but the scientific study of the, of the Earth's shape and measurements, geodetic, that's what it means, geodetic. So he says, modern, accurate modern geodetic measurements in recent years have proved that the Earth actually has four corners. These are protuberances that stand out from the basic geode that is the sphere of the Earth. The Earth is not a perfect sphere. No. They know that because they have satellites in space now, and they shoot these little lasers down, and they have mapped the entire surface of the Earth, like they're doing with the other planets. You know, we're look right now we're looking for planets to move to. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. We found two real good ones. Good luck. Make sure you get first class. It's going to be a long trip. But the earth, as Mr. Morris says, the earth is not a perfect sphere. The poles are actually flattened. And around the equator, it is fatter, and it has four corner, uh, corners that protrude from the equator. So what John was visioning 2,000 years ago was beyond any man's comprehension for accuracy, but was totally accurate to the extreme. So to, to mock him just shows you the ignorance of those that mock him. John knew what he was writing about a long time before he knew what the truth was. But the words that were placed in his mouth that he told his scribe to write were the perfect words to write. From these key positions then, from these four corners of the earth, these powerful angels are going to ensure that the wind should not blow on the earth, it says in our text, on the sea, or on any tree. Now oftentimes wind in scripture, again, is associated with God's judgment. And that's a good picture here. Uh, what we have, the picture is that, is that for at least the duration of this interlude in the seventh chapter, the wind by these powerful angels is being held back. God's judgment has stayed as we get a chance to examine what the Lord has for us here. There will be no wind. There will be no breeze. You can go to the ocean and look out over the ocean and there will be a wave in the ocean. Everything will be still. And it's a incredible, when you consider it, it's an incredible display of power. The wind is normally driven by 
the sun and the moon. And we know we've had, as we've seen in the seals, we've had a, a great effect on the heavenly bodies. And maybe this is part of the aftermath of that. But the power required to hold back wind from moving. And the earth's rotation has an impact on the wind. It has to. So all of these things that are put aside would require a great, tremendous power. But you know what? The holy angels are up to the task. Because the holy angels, uh, Psalm 103, 20, I think, says, the holy angels excel in strength. That's their major. They don't, they don't have any other, they, they don't minor in any, anything, but they excel in their strength. 103.20 it should be. The Greek word for this idea of holding is, is krateo. And krateo, a sense, says the word krateo means that you're holding back and they're fighting you. They're trying to get loose. So the holy angels are fighting to keep the wind from on the four corners of the earth. They're struggling against the force of the wind and they're holding it back. They're keeping God's wrath under restraint. The angelic restraining of the wind also symbolizes holding back the plagues that we're soon going to see in the trumpet judgments. So the next phase of God's wrath is restrained for a moment. The winds of judgment, as, they, as we might say, the, the, the wrath that is coming is building and building. This wind is, is building and building because the judgments that are coming are much greater than anything that has transpired before. The winds of judgment are gathering force and this is the first feature that I want us to see about these people. God has restrained His wrath from touching them. The second thing I want us to see is that these saints are sealed. Now for the reason of the temporary restraining of God's judgment becomes obvious as John now, see, the, the judgment has to be hold back, held back because now John sees and says another angel. And this is in addition to the four that are holding back the winds. Some of us have seen this as being Jesus Christ, but it's unlikely because the word that's used there for uh, <coughs> another is alos. And another, alos means it's uh, another in the sequence. There were four. This is now the fifth. Alos means it's another of the same kind. So this, this is another angel. And, uh, and uh, you know, some people get confused because in the Old Testament, uh, Jesus has uh, appeared as the angel of the Lord. But Jesus isn't an angel in essence, we know that. Additionally, later in the third verse, the, the, this fifth angel will say, uh, do not harm the earth and sea. Do. We have sealed, implying that he is part of the other four angels. They're all they're all working <coughs> in concert together. So John sees this angel. He's descending from the east. Where's John at? He's on the island of Patmos. Have you ever thought? John's on the island of Patmos. And he, he sees an angel descending from the east. What's in the east? Well, if you go to the east and just a little bit to the south from the island of Patmos, you'll find this, the city of Jerusalem, <coughs> the land of uh, God's promise of salvation through His Messiah, Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to be talking here about the 12 tribes that came from that land of Israel, members uh, that are about to be sealed. So the angel has this, he, he has with him, it says, the seal of the living God with him. He's bringing a seal with him. Uh, this is, that word in Greek is a very hard word, <coughs> a very hard word to pronounce. Safragis. And the first, the first uh, safra is S-F-R-A. It's hard to, it's hard to put an S in an S. <coughs> safragis. And safragis. 
Mahragis means a seal, and it's used in scripture also to describe, to describe signet rings. You ever familiar with signet rings? Uh, kings or other officials would uh, warm the wax and put it on a document, put the pages together, like on a scroll, wherever the two pages met. They would place warm wax and they put their signet wing, ring on it. It was used to uh, affirm authenticity and it would guarantee its security in travel because if somebody broke the seal, they'd be in a lot of trouble. So a seal denotes, I own it and I'm protecting it. So the angel is coming and he's bringing the seal and he's going to show those that are owned and those that are being protected. In contrast, uh, if you contrast this, the seals of petty earthly rulers, this seal is born by an angel. That's pretty significant. It's born by an angel of the living God. That's pretty significant. That verbiage is significant. The Bible frequently identifies God as the living God. This is a distinction. God wants to, I believe that word living is inserted there because he wants to make sure that you make the distinction in your mind when you read that, read that phrase. He's being, he is distancing himself from those who worship idols. This is a time of intense idol worship by unbelievers. His eternality uh, guarantees that he's going to be able to accomplish all that he wills to accomplish. Of course, the most prominent false deity of the time of the tribulation period is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist has his seal too. Does he not? What's the seal of the Antichrist? Six, 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 six. Yeah, the mark of the beast. And the true and living God is going to seal his followers. And so if it so I can guarantee you, see, Satan is nothing but a masquerader. He's a deceiver. We're going to get one of these to strap onto my head. <laughs> Just trying to find a size that's big enough. I can guarantee you if, 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 the, if, if Satan has a seal, the only reason he has a seal is because God has a seal. And what is God's seal? The Holy Spirit. Okay. But the word says that he will he will place a seal on his people. What does uh what does uh fourteen one identify it as? Revelation fourteen one. Just as Satan places his mark on his followers' forehead. God will place his mark on his followers' forehead. It will be the, the names of Christ and the Father. Now in the, in the Old Testament, God marked Israel with blood on their doorposts, remember, and lentils.
threshold of the temple. And I really think he doesn't want to leave. He's, 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 God is struggling because of his love for his people. And next, I think he goes to the eastern wall. Now, if God wants to go somewhere, what does he do? He goes. But in this instance, and that has nothing to do with the next one. But in this instance, I just find it fascinating yeah. how you see him, because I believe it's because of the love of his people. And if you, he goes to the east gate, and then he goes, he still doesn't leave, he goes to the east gate, and then he goes to the Mount of Olives. And then he leaves. Yeah. So, and then to continue with the scripture, it says, uh, and he called to the man clothed in linen. So we're talking about protecting from judgment. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writer's ink horn at his side. And the Lord said to him, this is in preparation for the invasion of the Babylonians. The Lord says, go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within. Mark all of my people so that they won't be, they won't perish. And, and then he says, and this is God's wrath, to the others he said in my hearing, go after him after he finishes going through the whole city and kill. And listen, do not let your eyes spare nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary yeah. at his house. Because he's left because of the abominations. And it begin, then it says men. And then, you know what it says then? Yeah. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Mm. They were held Reason. most responsible for the sins of I feel pretty good about it. Okay. <laughs> good. Amen. Amen. Some days I tremble. <laughs> I don't want to get the it's big head. It's awesome. <laughs> you know. yeah. I don't want to get the big head. But some days I tremble. <laughs> All right. Any, uh, so we'll, we'll continue on with uh, verse number four next week. Any comments? Questions? If I can answer them. Anybody? Well, in that passage you read, uh, it says it says a third. So a third of the Jews are going to be. Where was that passage? Oh, a, a third. I have that. Zachariah. Zachariah. That's what That's I interpreted. 12. A third will be allowed to pass through. pass through. And I believe by passing through. That's a remnant. Yes. You think that's the remnant? Yes. That's what I believe. And, and that sounds would... like for the prophecies that two thirds of the people who live in the land will be killed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a third will be that. So, that's a lot of, that's a lot of people. That's not a all third. Jews then? Huh? That's just Jews? Or yeah, that's, that's God's chosen that's people. That's chosen. That's yeah. referred to. Yeah. But you're going to see, you're going to see, uh, I think there's, I think there's a lot of, Statistics that will show us pretty much how many will survive as we go, as we get along into, because there's going to be, uh, you know, we've seen what percentage of the earth has been destroyed by the, the end of the fifth seal. Was it a fourth? Yeah, well, uh, I said like that. Right now the earth is inhabited by approximately 7 billion people. Yeah. We have seen 1.7 billion perish so far. And the, the slaughter has just begun. So. So is that the 144,000, or is this different? It's part. I believe 144,000 are part of this. But there's more than just 144,000 that survived. But I think there's 144,000 
that will have a, uh, all of them will be specially protected because to, to get through this time, you need special protection. Uh, only those that have special protection will get through. But I, I think that uh, the 144,000 will be gifted in evangelism. And I don't think all of the Jews will be gifted in evangelism, but the 144,000 will be. So. And the ones that they will lead to Christ at that time, Amen. well, many of them probably be martyred. <coughs> I agree, because yeah. of the great, the great amount of persecution. And being, yeah. just because the wrath that's coming is so great, it's hard to avoid it. And, uh, but, see, I prefer to think, see, I, I, I believe that these are two groups of survivors, even though some are destroyed in the wrath, because they still survive. They were so yeah. survived with God in heaven. So, survivors. They get to get there quick. Quicker than the other one. So. Anybody else? Anything else? Okay, well, thank you for coming again. Uh, let's stand and we'll pray. Wednesday night, we'll look at prayer. We're almost